And I'm pleased to um, have introduce Thomas, who will be presenting his dissertation defense. So Thomas, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen and get started. And if you could keep this to about 30 minutes, that would be very, very nice. I don't know if I'm ever ready. And uh, as you and I know, we just uh, finished up some last minute corrections there. So uh, it's one of those things that uh, unless you set the date and get started, you'll, you'll never be quite ready. There's always more that we can do. Uh, but first of all, thank you all very much for, uh, for joining me on this journey and uh, today's event. I'm so excited to share with you the results of this study and it's, uh, it's titled The Effects of Perceived Organizational Justice uh, of Inclusive Talent Management Practices on Employee Work Effort. So like I said, the very first thing I'd like to do is to extend some uh, gratitude to all of my committee members, uh, Dr. Nyman as a committee chair, uh, Dr. Ellinger and uh, Dr. Roberts. Appreciate so much your guidance and support and just assistance in getting me to this point all throughout this doctoral journey and uh, the culmination today. So excited, nervous to be here, but uh, happy to share the results. I'll start first with uh, some of the problem statement and kind of what guided me here. And, and even stepping back a little bit from that, I'd like to give just a 30 second uh, preview as to kind of why I went down this path of research. Um, you know, part of the cohort experience, what I really enjoyed was seeing all of my colleagues and how their interests and their experiences kind of led to their research questions and what they wanted to look at. Uh, so very briefly, a uh, previous job that I held, uh, I was very lucky to be identified as a high potential employee. And what I realized is that that selection process was a very closed door, secretive, um, kind of rife with rumors and such. And the folks that did not get selected had a very um, negative experience following that. And I could see that they're kind of work effort, their commitment, their engagement, all kind of decreased because they wanted to be identified as these high potential employees. And so over time, that kind of just nurtured in my brain, you know, what is the, the outcome of not identifying somebody as a high potential or somebody that's capable of contributing more to the organization? So that's kind of my background story as to what led me to this research. And more specifically at what I was looking at is this field of talent management and how we identify, nurture, and develop employees through this process. So more specifically on my slide here, you can see that the empirical study of talent management has largely been relegated to what are the benefits that an organization can recognize from identifying these select few employees. There really hasn't been a lot of look at uh, what the negative outcomes can be from those that are not identified. And also an exclusive talent management program that uh, promotes that work effort, tries to get more engagement and commitment and effort from certain employees may have the very opposite effect on those that are not selected for inclusion. And so we look at the purpose of my study, very specifically, what is it that I'm looking at? It's to conduct a test of a theoretical model. You can see it depicted there on the screen and it looks relatively simple, but as the analysis will show, it uh, is a very complex model in terms of the analysis and what goes into it. Um, but uh, we're looking at distributive justice as a mediator between that relationship of inclusive talent management practices and how that ultimately affects work effort. And then how does procedural justice kind of fit into that? All of that to say kind of specifically, are inclusive talent management practices related to increased perceptions of distributive justice and ultimately work effort? Very, very short and very kind of generic language. If we do more inclusive talent management practices, do we get better outcomes? And so that's kind of the very large question that I'm trying to attempt to answer with this research. As we look at the conceptual framework, kind of what guided this research, there's really two underlying theories. And as I kind of worked with this research and, and learned more about it and kind of dove into it, a revelation that kind of uh, revealed itself to me is that these two theories are two different ways of looking at this problem. If you look at social exchange theory, it's really a little bit more from the employee's perspective, or at least in the context of this study. Uh, the concept being that, you know, as an employee, if I provide this amount of work or this level of commitment or this engagement, that I should receive complimentary remuneration, whether it's salary, benefits, identification as a high potential. And so again, in the context of this research, that social exchange theory is kind of guiding the employee's perspective. On the other side is the human resource architecture theory. And here we're explaining the unique and valuable nature of employees. You know, Every organization says their employees are their most valuable asset, but do their practices and particularly their talent management practices really lead to that outcome? And so that's a little bit more of the perspective of the employer viewing their employees as um, valuable assets to the organization. So again, these two theories kind of underlie uh, this research as we go forward. 
obviously did a literature review on the primary domains for this research, starting with talent management. We can see that this is definitely a growth stage field that's nearing the mature phase. So we're, we're getting to that point where we've almost got a broadly accepted definition. Right now it's generally accepted and we can see very slight variations of it, but there's not a definitive single definition of exactly what is talent management and what does it mean for organizations. There's a tremendous amount of practitioner interest in talent management as a field. So we've got both the research and scholarly interest that's still growing and developing, but there's a huge demand in the practitioner field, which speaks to a couple of things, I think. First, that there's a demand for research on this, this concept of talent management. The practitioners are thirsty for this type of insert um, um, findings and research developments uh, to kind of guide their practices. The real crux of the conflict in talent management has been this inclusive or exclusive approach to talent management. Uh, the inclusive is a concept where talent is universal to all employees, and it's kind of the organization's role and job to grow, develop, identify, kind of pull out that talent. The opposite view is the exclusive view, which is saying that there are a unique few employees that disproportionately contribute to the organization's success. And so an organization is best uh, driven to kind of identify and develop those key employees. And so a lot of the research, the, the, the vast majority of the research in talent management is kind of this quandary between the inclusive approach. Do I give development to all employees or do I exclusively identify a small subset and just develop those employees? And ultimately that leads to this concept of workforce differentiation. How do you identify who these high potential employees are? And should we make it a broader definition? Should we tell them that they've been identified and all kinds of uh, problems associated with that? Uh, so that kind of, what do we do with this information between the inclusive or exclusive approach? And as a bit of a side note, that concept has always been kind of viewed very black and white. It's either all or nothing. Inclusive, every employee, all employees are valuable. Exclusive is typically defined as between two and 10% of your workforce. So a very small subset. This concept of workforce differentiation then naturally leads into the ideas of organizational justice. When you're selecting a very small portion of your group or your employees, how does that affect that group and then the larger group? And so these concepts of organizational justice become very relevant here. Now, initially, organizational justice was limited very much towards re uh, reward allocation. In other words, how much do we pay individuals? Pay versus bonus versus uh, kind of incentivizing sales and such. And over time, as that field mature, they moved more into the process. And kind of a way to illustrate that is if you think of a, a courtroom, like a trial for an individual, it's not just the outcome that the parties are interested in, right? So whether they're guilty or innocent, um, whatever the outcome of the trial is, it's also the process of the trial itself. If a defendant or a prosecutor can be convinced that the process was fair, they're more likely to accept the outcome. So the same thing applies to organizational justice. There is an outcome component distributive justice. And then there's also the process component of that justice, procedural justice. Now there's additional formats and, and portions of justice, but those two distributive and procedural are what factor into this research. Um, traditionally, organizational justice has been looked at as an antecedent of outcomes. In other words, justice leads to these other outcomes. And so most research into organizational justice looks at justice as the antecedent and different employee level and organization level outcomes as uh, the, the after effects of organizational justice. However, what leads to those perceptions of justice has much less study. In other words, what are these triggers? What causes people to have these perceptions of justice? And that's kind of what this research does, looking at inclusive talent management as an antecedent of perceptions of justice. Here we can see that organizational justice has been demonstrated to support different levels of employee outcomes, as well as organization level outcomes. A little bit less on the organization level, obviously it's easier to measure and look at individual outcomes. Lastly, for this research, I identified work effort as the desired outcome, mainly because that's so closely connected to that input of inclusive talent management. You know, if an organization is investing time, money, resources, uh, into development of employees, they hope to see a return on that investment and work efforts seems like a very logical return on investment thing to measure in terms of my, uh, my expenses there. So looking at work effort it is typically placed between motivation, something that motivates the employee and an outcome variable, uh, variable again, some other individual or organization level 
out. A lot of theoretical frameworks include work effort, but there's really no defining uh, independent theory about what work effort is, how it comes to be, and what it leads to. And so it's broadly used, but poorly defined on its own, which I think is kind of interesting and, and leads to some future research opportunities. Um, a key point to, uh, to mention about work effort is that it measures predisposition. It is not uh, an objective measurement of individuals quantifying work effort. So it's uh, also in alignment with the rest of this research study, which is perception-based, perceptions of inclusive talent management, perceptions of organizational justice, and then employees' self-reported perceptions of their own work effort. So all of this combined comes into uh, the theoretical model that we are looking at with this research. And again, that is that inclusive talent management leads to perceptions of justice, specifically distributive justice, which ultimately define work effort. And the way procedural justice fits in there is that it moderates that relationship between distributive justice and work effort. And the literature kind of supports that finding that procedural justice is very often a moderator for the relationship between distributive justice and various different outcomes. So looking at my hypotheses and kind of more specifically to these, uh, this model, the first hypothesis was rather basic, and that is that there is a, a direct positive relationship between inclusive talent management and distributive justice. So very basic, very intuitive, the more inclusive an organization's talent management practices are, the greater the likelihood of employees reporting positive perceptions of distributive justice. So that's hypothesis number one. Number two introduces that mediation effect. In other words, the inclusive talent management is going to have some effect on work effort, but that effect is mediated by perceptions of distributive justice. And so that second hypothesis is, um, is introducing that mediation effect of distributive justice and is also a sort of precursor to hypothesis number three, which introduces procedural justice to the model. And so here we're saying that everything up to this point has talked about these relationships now, how do those relationships change or are they affected when we introduce procedural justice? And I want to point out as a kind of, again, another aside here, there's multiple different places that that moderation can occur. So we can moderate that direct relationship from inclusive talent management to work effort. We can moderate the first stage of that, which would be between inclusive talent management and distributive justice. And in my case, what I did based on the literature and previous research was propose that procedural justice moderated the relationship between distributive justice and work effort. In other words, procedural justice would determine how strongly distributive justice affects work effort. So in designing my study, I'm looking at a three-wave quantitative study. So not quite longitudinal, but three different points in time where I'm trying to temporally separate uh, individuals as they take the survey. So three different points in time and three separate surveys for these individuals. Of course, the surveys were developed in Qualtrics and then deployed in Amazon MTurk. And that was a purposeful decision because the nature of this research, if we go way back to when I first kind of started thinking about this concept, uh, the initial plan was to find a single organization that had a high potential program and I could kind of evaluate uh, candidates that were selected for that program and those that were not. Uh, the problem there is, first of all, you're identifying a very small percentage of your organization. So you'd have to have a massive organization in order to find enough individuals that were qualified to have a, a sufficiently sized sample. Um, so ultimately what I went with was MTurk because it's providing a broad sample of individuals across different organizations, industries, um, work levels. And so there's just a much broader approach to getting that kind of result. And so it really actually complements uh, the research design. So I'm, I'm pleased with that decision to go to MTurk. The actual scales that I used for this, uh, three previously validated scales. So these were existing, they're in the literature and demonstrated to be uh, reliable and usable. And then lastly, the analysis was conducted largely with M plus based on the moderated mediation design, which is a surprisingly complex way to, uh, to analyze this uh, proposal. And then some ancillary kind of uh, statistical analyses with, uh, with R, the software product. Looking at the surveys, number one took in the demographic information. And uh, while it's traditionally used at the end of the survey or the end of the project, process. Um, uh, frankly, it was a, a monetary uh, driver for that. Um, we are ending up eliminating a lot of candidates because they don't fit the criteria of the study. And so putting demographics on the front end uh, prevented them from having to take the surveys and the subsequent surveys and ultimately being uh, lost data. So we uh, put demographics at the front end, as well as the inclusive talent management practices and distributive justice skills.
The second survey was the procedural justice scale. So attempting to kind of separate those two and collecting them at different points in time contributed a little bit to that uh, common method bias. So separating that a little bit. And then finally with the work effort scale on survey three. So each of these surveys were separated by at least uh, seven days. So invitations to subsequent surveys were submitted uh, seven days after an individual completed the uh, previous, previous survey. The population and sample, again, trying to narrowly focus this as much as possible in terms of demographics and the audience that I want to look at. So looking at employed full-time individuals in the U.S. First of all, full-time because that demonstrates the nature of the relationship between the employee and the employer. So contract, part-time, temporary, all these other kind of categories, it's a slightly different relationship, slightly different perceptions and expectations. And so to really focus the research, I, uh, I chose full-time individuals. And in the US was also, again, to kind of narrowly focus this, uh, different organizations, or rather different countries, different uh, residents of countries other than the US have different cultural values in terms of looking at the relationship between an employee and an employer. What are those expectations, that social exchange theory? And so limiting it to the US kind of drove that as very focused. 20 to 39 years of age, this is the largest group in the workforce right now, the millennials. So kind of limiting it again to a very specific work group. At least some college education was a way to focus it again even further. So these are individuals with at least some college and uh, some of those have as well advanced degrees and, and folks in the middle there as well. And we'll see with the chi-square analysis how that uh, shaped up. Lastly is their type of occupation. So we wanted to focus this in terms of you could say white collar jobs, more knowledge based workers. So this avoids some individuals that may be in union organizations, more typically blue collar positions that have a little bit different relationship with their employer and also their advancement of their careers. And so focusing on these specific occupations as defined by the Bureau of Labor Statistics help to focus the population. A sample frame, like I discussed, was Amazon's MTurk, and the sample size that I ended up with was 371 usable responses. We targeted uh, 270 responses based on a very broad rule of thumb, 10 responses per question, 27 questions, a minimum of 270, and thankfully ended up with 371 usable responses. The instrumentation, I won't uh, spend too much time on this. Again, we used, uh, well, three scales and, and one I kind of split out as that distributive justice to demonstrate the questions there. But uh, these are previously published and used. They were used uh, verbatim as they were published with the exception of the inclusive talent management scale. That was previously used in an academic setting. And so the, the wording of the questions, I altered very slightly from um, your university to your employer. So just changing out that one word to make a little bit more broad appeal versus very specific to that academic setting. But you can see there are around five, six items per, uh, per measurement and most run that five point Likert type scale with the exception of procedural justice, which used a seven point Likert type scale. Now the data collection here, you can see uh, the resulting uh, way that we reached our qualified respondents at the very end, 371 total responses over the three surveys. Uh, screened out quite a few folks in that first front end first survey there just based on largely demographics so meeting that uh, age us based and uh, and all the other qualifications to reach it the paid respondents versus qualified respondents so some of the questions i did not list uh, as a requirement to take the survey for example um, education level occupation uh, so those I screened out after I had made payments. So while I still paid them for their time to take that survey, they didn't meet what I was looking for. So I excluded them from further surveys. And you can see kind of the response rate. Um, obviously screened out uh, represented very small numbers with surveys number two and three. Did a series of chi-square analysis to see how my sample compared to the population targets. So population figures we're gathered from the Census Bureau and also the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. We can see that uh, gender and occupation were neither statistically or um, um, significantly different from the, from the population. The two issues there were race, ethnicity, and highest level of education, which were both statistically and practically uh, significantly different. So a slight problem there. To resolve that, looked at the residual analysis, and uh, we can see that for race and ethnicity, the Asian Pacific Islander category was slightly overrepresented relative to the population, while Hispanic uh, or those that identify Hispanic were slightly underrepresented. And then looking at education again, so we can see that those with some college were slightly underrepresented, and those with a four-year degree were slightly overrepresented, indicating that MTurk sample uh, as a whole or a collective was slightly more educated uh, than the population at large. 
With that completed, we went into the measurement model analysis, looking at the model itself, doing that uh, measurement model analysis. And I realized that the uh, image there is, is rather small on the screen. If you'd like, you can see figure seven on page number 91 in the document. But suffice it to say, all factor loadings were above that threshold of 0.5 and all were below the upper threshold of 0.95. And most were above that more stringent threshold of 0.7. Each variable, of course, correlated most highly with its respective factor. And then we demonstrated adequate reliability and convergent validity. You can see the table on the right-hand side showing uh, those coefficients. Pause for just a moment here and explain again, because it's a moderated mediation, we're looking at a variety of different ways of looking at this model. So first is the theoretical model. This is what we use to kind of understand the concept of what I'm looking at. So we can see there's mediation, there's moderation, we combine them and we get moderated mediation. But then between the baseline and the interaction model, so M plus and really the analysis of how we look at moderated mediation, um, looking at typical fit indices is not appropriate for the latent variable interactions. And so we're gonna an analyze it slightly differently by looking at the baseline model first. So we're not considering that interaction between distributive justice and procedural justice, just looking at the baseline model. And then we'll do the interaction model and compare just the AIC and BIC. And you'll see on a subsequent table here how those numbers shake out. But I just wanted to pause for a moment and show the different models and kind of how they fit into the analysis in terms of what I'm looking at, whether it's the baseline or the interaction. Looking at table nine here, this is uh, one of the more important tables in the, the research. So it shows a number of things. I wanna call your attention to just a few of these numbers here. First, again, because we're not looking at the typical fit indices for the ultimate interaction model, we're gonna compare them. So initially, I'm gonna look at the baseline model and make sure that that's a good fit first. And if it's not a good fit at the baseline, it's not gonna get any better uh, looking at the interaction model. So I can see that my comparative fit index and Tucker-Lewis index are both above that threshold of 0 0.90. We can see that my uh, RMSEA and SRMR both uh, below that threshold of 0 0.08. And then looking at the AIC. So here we are comparing it. We wanna see that the AIC is lower for the interaction model, indicating less data loss as we add that interaction effect. So that's a good indication there that AIC is lower for the interaction model. Same with the uh, BIC number as well. It's lower for the interaction model. Lastly, I'm gonna look at my two hypothesized paths, and it's important that I can see that they are all statistically significant. So uh, both my path from inclusive talent management to distributive justice, and then the interaction of those two onto work efforts. So seeing that both of those are uh, statistically significant is a good indication to move forward. Now, this table is also the heart of the dissertation, and this caused a lot of grief over the uh, months leading up to this, but uh, finally got it to a good place, and I'll uh, call out some of these numbers and explain it. Starting in that first column there, we can see that 0.649 number is the same for both low and high values of procedural justice. So to measure that moderation, we're looking at procedural justice there at uh, high and low values which would translate to one standard deviation above or below the mean average for procedural justice. So because I'm hypothesizing that it affects the second stage from DJ to work effort, distributed justice to work effort, I would expect that the first stage is exactly the same, and it is, so that's a good indication. Next, I wanna to look to see between that first and second stage, is there a statistically significant difference between low or high values? And we can see here the difference value in the second stage is statistically significant. The bold numbers indicate statistical significance. So I know that there is a difference between these two values. And now I look up to the uh, numbers above that and I see that for low values of procedural justice, when procedural justice is one standard deviation below the mean, now that second stage effect becomes important. And then ultimately the final number that I'm looking at there is the indirect effect difference. So I see that there is a statistically significant difference in the indirect effect at low value versus high value procedural justice. So this is all speaking to that hypothesis number three, that the moderating effect of procedural justice varies um, or changes on different values of that procedural justice. So summarizing my hypothesis findings, hypothesis number one was stating again, very simply that there is a, a statistical significance a relationship between inclusive talent management and distributive justice. In other words, higher uh, perceptions of inclusive talent management leads to increased perceptions of distributive justice that was supported with that very, um, very simple path of 0.622 from uh, between those two variables. The second hypothesis, um, and actually, let me pause for just a moment here as well and uh, mention to my committee, my uh, sincere apologies, there are a couple of typos 
on page number 97 in the actual document that the uh, dissertation submission. Um, there's basically typographical errors in the statistical significance. We're missing a zero after the decimal point. And then finally, it's saying that the uh, combination of these two results in a uh, positive, it should be negative, uh, and it is competitive um, uh, mediation, not, uh, not uh, compulsive. In hypothesis number two, we are supporting that as well. So this is the complementary mediation, um, rather competitive mediation. So complementary is incorrect in the dissertation. It should be competitive mediation. And the statistical values are statistically significant. It is typographical error missing the leading zero there. Uh, indicating as such. So that was also supported. Lastly, number three is showing that uh, looking at table 10, as I just uh, just showed in the last slide, there is a uh, statistically significant difference at low and high values of procedural justice, uh, which supports that uh, hypothesis number three. Briefly here on some implications for research, we've got four implications for research. The first is that uh, this study makes a contribution to the field of human resource development. It partially answers the call for more rigorous methodology in the research. So typically this moderated mediation would look at it and analyze it using multiple regression. Uh, for this research study, I use structural equation modeling, allows you for the modeling of errors and some additional insight. And so it's just a more robust, rigorous way of looking at this problem. So it certainly um, partially answers that call for more rigorous research uh, in the field. Number two, this provides some advancements for organizational justice. We are validating some previous findings supporting that, again, that procedural justice moderates the relationship between distributive justice and outcome variables. Finding number three there, the implication for research is a contribution to the talent management literature. Again, it's a, a growth field. It's still kind of reaching and approaching that maturing phase. And so we're partially answering that call for additional research there, providing some additional insight into the uh, outcomes and antecedents of talent management, particularly how it fits in with organizational justice. And then finally, the uh, last research implication there is a contribution to the ongoing debate between that inclusive exclusive approach partially by reframing the debate. Again, we're looking at it uh, up until now as a very black and white. It's either exclusive or inclusive. And this research starts to support a more nuanced view of that. It's not so much black and white versus degrees of inclusivity and then how that inclusivity is communicated. And we'll see that in uh, some of the future research opportunities here, concepts such as uh, purposely withholding information from employees or do you share it, do you announce it? Uh, so it does start to contribute to that thought process. Some implications for practice, again, there's four implications here. And again, because this is so interesting in terms of talent management to practitioners, this should be insightful. It informs and supports practitioners in quantifying the return on investment. So if we're going to invest dollars and assets and resources into talent management and development, what are we getting back on the back end in terms of work effort? So this begins to contribute and begins to answer that question. Number two here, we recognize the implications of specific talent management practices. So it's not just the talent management inclusivity, justice plays a factor there. And so the way you handle talent management development affects perceptions of justice, which affects work effort and certainly other outcome variables as well. Number three, this research emphasizes the need for practitioners to be mindful of the employee's perceptions of organizational justice. And while this has been kind of framed as a talent management research initiative that speaks a lot to their organizational justice and the perceptions of organizational justice, how talent management leads to those perceptions and how those perceptions ultimately affect their work effort. And lastly, it also contributes to that debate again over the use of inclusive versus exclusive and kind of argues for a little more nuanced view of that in terms of how it is, um, it is uh, deployed in terms of inclusive or exclusive. Like any research, there's a number of limitations associated with this. Just so happened there are four primary limitations that we're gonna talk about. First, this entire research was subjective and perception-based with self-reported responses. So there's some biases there and some considerations uh, attempted to address that with common method bias and avoidance the way the, uh, the survey was structured and, and deployed, uh, but it remains that there was a subjective uh, self-reported bias. Number two is the social desirability, particularly of the work effort scale. Now, on the one hand, there was really no reason for someone to, uh, to misrepresent their work effort here. This is a completely anonymous survey by a third party. Their employer had practically no chance of ever seeing these results. And so while I don't think this net specifically significantly altered the results, it is something to think about, that social desirability bias, particularly of the work effort scale. Mm -hmm. 
Third limitation is that the sample is not entirely representative of the desired population. So just a slightly uh, differences there. We noticed in the race ethnicity and also in education, the uh, sample frame tended to be a little bit more educated and a couple of the categories in race and ethnicity were either under or overreported. And finally, number four there, this was a very narrowly focused in terms of US-based, very specific occupations and an age range of 20 to 39, making these millennial employees. So it's not broadly generalizable to the entire workforce. However, this is a large percentage of the American and US workforce. Uh, so it is an important limitation to note. Finally here, mentioned a couple of avenues for future research. First is additional outcome variables. Work effort is a single outcome variable. There's a number of additional outcome variables, both at the individual and the organization level that could be considered that we've kind of made this groundwork in terms of inclusive talent management and then the distributive justice and uh, procedural justice. Looking at number two is to incorporate some objective archive data. So rather than employees' perception of inclusive talent management practices, perhaps we could develop a sort of ground-based objective measurement of how inclusive particular specific uh, talent management practices are, whether they tend to be inclusive or exclusive. And then archive data, of course, is gonna be more uh, insightful in terms of specifically uh, objective information and measuring different uh, components. Number three is a little bit more robust talent management scale. So I was lucky to find the scale that I did. Like I said, it was mentioned um, and driven specifically towards academic uh, environments. So altered it very slightly for more broad business-based environments, but a little bit more robust there in terms of talent management practices. That also speaks to number two in terms of utilizing objective archive data. And lastly there, number four is looking at additional, a little bit more diverse populations. So it might be really interesting to compare uh, different countries. So you look at organizations in the US where the relationship between employee and employer uh, has one specific kind of meaning and cultural values and looking at that in different countries where that relationship is different may be very revealing in terms of how employees perceive organization practices. With that said, I'd like to thank all of the uh, guests and participants in today's uh, discussion and defense very much for your time, particularly for the committee. I appreciate uh, all of your support all along. And uh, thank you all for your kind attention. I'm happy to answer any questions and invite a discussion. Thank you very, very much, Thomas. That was very nice. Um, I, I will start. Um, Andrea, would you have any questions or comments that you'd like to provide? Yes, I would um, echo the compliments that Kim just shared. I thought you did a really nice job. It's a very nicely written dissertation. Uh, obviously, a lot of effort went into this and you have some interesting findings. Um, I told Kim during our private meeting that as I went through this, I know you're in the midst of doing some uh, refinement with um, Sarah. So I just kind of made a listing of little things that I might've caught. Um, like, so there are some of them are just kind of basic, but for example, like, do you need a chapter two summary? You know, all the other chapters had a summary, might you need that and then put it in the table of contents. Um, some other little things, you know, this, your dissertation is five uh, chapters instead of three chapters. So I've noted some of those. Um, I did only have a couple of questions and then maybe a couple of suggestions uh, for maybe research and one thing at the end. But um, one thing, and, I, and it might be something that was a typo because I think I understand it more with your presentation. But when you define the purpose of your study, you used a particular figure on page five and then when you did it again on page 48, you used the interaction figure as the figure that was supposed to reflect your theoretical model. And I think it's the, it, I think that's not probably accurate because then I kept thinking, why do we have a different model? So I, I just, you know, that kind of struck me, but I think that might just be uh, a placement of maybe a figure. Um, and then the other thing is, um, as I just kind of go through, I'm just going to maybe point out a couple things. When you go into your discussion on page um, 103 and 105, uh, 104 on chapter five, I actually switch it. And I was even thinking as I was listening to here, organizational justice is really important, but I think your study is about talent management more broadly and then the organizational justice piece in it. So I would kind of reverse it and not say, oh, lastly, the stuff on talent management, I'd start with that first. So okay. like, you know, so I, I just think that's really, you're trying to get people to really understand the contribution to talent management in doing that, then you actually help them understand the important pieces of justice that fit in. Um, just a, one, other, one other comment on future research. Um, you said it and it's not, you kind of talk about this notion of culture in your presentation. 
But I actually think instead of saying go beyond more than geographic region, speak about that. Like the, speak about the idea that there might be varied cultural context that could really influence by country, you know, by region, whatever you want to say it. But I really think that that has like that really hits it a little bit more because just geographic, you know, regions might not necessarily translate to like really different kinds of cultural contexts. Um, the other thing for future research maybe is transparency. You know, I might think my organization is fairly fair in terms of outcome and maybe procedures, but how transparent is that really communicated? So I think you kind of touch on that with your communication ideas. Um, I thought about the idea of engagement as an outcome, since that's a big one. And, you know, most of the workplace is kind of disengaged or even not even working at the moment. So that might be a really good one to think. Does providing learning opportunities more broadly and career enhancement opportunities really impact something that we, we need in that outcome? And you, you expressed this a while ago, I think early on, the idea of um, looking at inclusive and exclusive, those who are brought in and identified and those that are left out. So I thought somewhere in your future research, maybe you speak about comparative analysis. You know, maybe you know, you've identified these two approaches and maybe you can start looking at, does it matter? Like when people are not included, do certain things matter to not disrupt their work effort as long as they know why they're not included versus right. those that are included, something like that. Um, and one last question and I'll turn it over to everybody else. I know you have a good reason for this, but I was thinking if you publish this, I'm wondering if somebody would say, um, is if you look at organizational justice and you did a nice job in the literature review, there's probably like different models or constructs. So it might be that somebody would say, how come you focused on distributive and procedural without also thinking about interactional or maybe it's interpersonal. I don't know, I'm, I'm you know, maybe one of the other points. So it might just be something to think about. Is, the, is it just something that's not ever included or maybe that makes a difference longer term? But overall, like I said, I just had little notes and comments and I'll PDF them to you, but um, nothing, nothing of any major consequence, just more kind of thinking through future ideas. Dr. Ellinger, thank you so much. Those are fantastic recommendations. And uh, you know, to your mention of kind of communication and how it's uh, mentioned, that was kind of one avenue that I was initially looking at is how do we communicate? And uh, this concept came up that I found fascinating. It's called strategic ambiguity. It's organizations that purposely withhold this information. It's the idea that if you let somebody know that they're high potential, they kind of get this crown print syndrome. They think they're God's gift to the organization. They begin kind of acting as such and maybe even reducing their work effort. Uh, but absolutely a very interesting future research avenue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Paul, comments? Yes, okay. Um, several things. First, Thomas, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I, sometimes you get to this point and the dissertation has been such a huge focus that the presentation of the information gets kind of lost. You did a phenomenal job in preparing a deck. I especially appreciated your references within your deck and the way you tied those back. And then also the clarity of your explanation. You, you'll Thank do very well presenting this research in a, in a public forum. And Thank because again, you, you, you took a lot of the quantitative data that I kind of put my fingers in my ears and start la 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 and, and you explained it very clearly. <laughs> And so I, I do appreciate that, uh, the way you did that. Uh, like, like Andrea, I got really excited um, about some of the things in your intro, uh, especially the, as we looked at the have nots, I guess I will call them. And you mentioned several areas of concern. And, and so certainly uh, that engagement factor, how it applies there. And so the other comment here that I had is you've got such a powerful research agenda. And so the, the ability for you to take what is very obvious and on the surface here and, and go ahead and, and plow that through into a, a greater research agenda uh, is, is really exciting in my mind. You, you've got something that has legs that will take you a long way. And, and maybe to that end, where do you expect this degree to take you? What are your what are your hopes and ambitions? I understand that uh, you, you have some near future 
things going on that you no know, i like academia i like teaching as much as research and so um you know as, as i'm able to and, and you mentioned that research agenda that was part of the excitement about this is number one I, I like this field of talent management i like organizational justice i like the intersection of those two and then it's just a huge benefit that talent management is kind of reaching that mature stage and there's a lot of practitioner interest and so I think, you know, going forward, my career goals and how I'd like to use and leverage this research, number one is towards a research agenda. Um, thankfully, I'm not sick enough of talent management to kind of give up and move to something else. Uh, there's a lot of other questions, a lot of avenues, a lot of things that still interest and excite me about it. So I'm very excited to see where else this leads me and just kind of start you know, pulling apart the knot. Um, in terms of a career, I'd like to continue uh, teaching and researching and just leverage this research agenda to that end. I know one of the things I, I, I talk to our students about, and sometimes it's a little bit daunting, but I always want to know, what are you going to be the best in the world at? And I think you've got a couple of questions here that are very interesting and can identify you as the best in the world, that you can establish that credibility around those. And, and so uh, I, I, I'm excited that you have so many areas that are really very closely tied to this. And so I, I, I think that will be great and will serve you very well classroom. Cause as I said, your presentation skills are excellent. So Kim, that's thank all you. I have. Thank you. Just real briefly, Dr. Roberts, thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. And, and absolutely to that end, kind of how I explore the different avenues of this, I, I really think it's that intersection of talent management and organizational justice is kind of the heart of where I'd like to specialize and then all the pieces that fit into that. But, but absolutely, I appreciate the insight. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, like I said, there's, there's some, again, the idea of looking at the have nots, whether that is 90 to 98% of the population that are kind of being excluded you know, take, taking your numbers, uh, it, it's an important group that can't be ignored. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure if you buy Thomas um, a beverage, he can tell you about his attempt to study the haves and the have-nots and the, the, um, the opportunities for um, self-development <laughs> that happened through that process. Um, <laughs> all right, um, Andre, did that pose any additional questions or comments for you? No, I think I'm pretty well set. The only thing I did wonder is, you know, given the fact that you have this passion for research around this topic, where do you think you're going to publish your initial article? <laughs> uh, I really haven't narrowed down a list. I'm, I'm looking at a variety, you know, any of those outlets that kind of look at organizational justice and talent management. Talent management is kind of everywhere. Uh, personnel psychology is, is kind of towards the top of the list just because it, some of the past research that they've published is very similar. Um, but I uh, haven't really narrowed it down much beyond that, just kind of speaks up. But I do plan to publish and, and look forward to that. And, and maybe look at um, the Journal of Human Resource Management. I mean, David Collings is an associate editor on one of those or was at one point. So maybe check out the, the players on some of the, the teams because uh, there is probably an interest in the topic. Okay. Uh, and you Excellent. definitely cite his work a good bit. Yes. Thank you. I think you'd be interested. Okay. All right. Well, I will have the committee um, adjourn and you all keep Thomas company while I do that, please. <laughs> okay. We're back. Well, where's Thomas? Oh, He's there. Thomas. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, the committee has convened and is very, very pleased to indicate that you have passed your dissertation defense. So congratulations. Yay.